Perfect. Aaron Miller, welcome to the Homeless Podcast, my friend. Thank you, sir. So, uh, so here's what's kind of cool. So you're a guy who got connected to the podcast through some guys that you work around and with. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Jason Biasi and Ross Lockhart. That's right. Uh, my buddies, and uh, they, they also work in and around the Vancouver School of Theology, where my office is, and my church meets in their chapel as well. So, right on. So, yeah. is this church that you're a part of? Is mm. this is this a ministry of the of the school of the campus? It's just uh, what is it? No, it's kind of a weird uh, situation. It, the church itself was started back in the day to be the worshiping community for the seminary. So like the principal of the school was the preacher on Sundays and mm. everybody lived on campus and, you know, like, uh, and, and uh, faculty and staff would come to church, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, and over the years that kind of changed. And um, so now it's just, now it's a, a United Church of Canada, a mainline, I don't know if you know anything about the United, if you know anything about the United Church, you probably know some sort of caricature about us, but uh-huh. that's all right. And uh, um, anyway, so we're, we're just a mainline church that happens to meet on a campus. It's kind of peculiar. So we're not actually, we're sort of close to the school, but not part of it. My aunt, We rent space from the school, so I get to hang around and get invited to things I might not otherwise get invited to just because I'm here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so we our, our church itself looks like a sort of regular kind of small mainline church with a mix of ages and stages. Uh, we got some students, but not nearly as many as you might imagine being on a campus. It's one of the things we're kind of working on figuring out how a mainline church that, uh, you know, came to came to life in the, the, the last of the glory years of Christendom uh, has to pivot now all of a sudden. Not even all of a sudden, but it feels all of a sudden. Right. Like all of a sudden what we always used to do doesn't work anymore. And people don't show up just because you do a good thing. Right. Uh, and... The other funny thing about our chapel is you can't see it from any direction, so nobody's stumbling across us. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Just nestled, just nestled into the. Yeah, it's a beautiful the... space. Like, so there's a big garden out front, and then trees out back, and there's glass on all sides, and stone on the walls, and it's this really lovely space that people people will come just for the space. Uh, but uh, but yeah, you can't like it's not like our signs out on the main drag inviting people in or. <laughs> You know, wow. uh, it's it's really it's a really weird thing, but uh, yeah, they're a beautiful bunch, and we're glad to be here. Uh, and how long have you been there? This is my fourth Christmas, so just three and a half years or so. Yeah, got right here July July 2016. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. So. Uh, and- so let me so let me ask you this. So let me yeah. ask you this. Um, is it is it I'm a terrible judge of character. I'm a terrible judge of character. I have no problem admitting this. I'm the worst at this. Okay. Like, like my favorite game is like what type? What's their enneagram type? Like that's one of my favorite games. Hey, I never get it right. Never. Right. Not one time ever have I ever got it right. It's just like <laughs> I definitely know what they're completely wrong. Always wrong. Right. Um, but but here's my here's my perception. Um, when I think about Jason Biasi. Yeah. And I think about Ross Lockhart. Yeah. And then I take you and I put you with your flat bill and your beard right in the middle of those guys. It <laughs> seems like, seems like that's an odd fit. Is it an odd fit? Uh, kind of. Well, I mean, Enneagram's kind of funny. I, I, I would bet dollars to donuts. Ross is a three, and and I know that uh, uh, Jason's a six, and I'm a nine. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we fit right in there together. Yeah, like you sure do. That's good. The yeah, three of us need each other in order absolutely to Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what would I do in this situation? I don't know. What would I do in this situation? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you guys do share a line. Yeah, you guys do yeah, share yeah. a line. So, yeah. Uh, I, and yeah, and, and uh, I don't know. I like hanging out with people who aren't, aren't much like me. I mean, uh-huh. Ross, you know, likes to point out that I'm his hipster pastor friend. and. <laughs> You know, uh, and uh, and that's that's great. You know, oh, everybody man. fulfills a role. You know, yeah. I can't pull a bow tie. Yeah, oh, that's a fact. That's <laughs> a fact. Like I'm the same. 
First yeah. off, you, nobody's going to see it on you or me. No one's going to see it I, t- People tell me I should wear my collar all the time because it would be kind of cool on the campus, right? But you can't tell. It looks just like I'm wearing an ugly black shirt. It doesn't matter. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a uh, that's a wild uh, that's a wild match when I think about it. Um, yeah. So you're nine on the enneagram. Yeah, hard. <laughs> hard nine, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. So. Oh, with an eight wing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Although it means that I sometimes have really strong opinions about things and don't want to do anything about it. <laughs> that's funny. Right. Yeah, that's funny. Sorry. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a seven. I'm a seven with an eight wing. Yeah. Uh, so I love having a good time and uh, really think it's awesome when we get to be confrontational. Yeah. And so the two sides of me are just like, hey, do you want to have some fun? And the other one's just like, yeah, who are we going to mess up? Right. <laughs> like, who's going to get it? I, I, I would guess that my brother's a, he's, he's my music minister, and I think he's a seven with an eight wing. Uh, he's got a lot of eight tendencies, but. You just love to have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. So I took it. So I took the Enneagram. I went to Enneagram Institute and went through this whole thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, um, so my scores came back. And so what it came back with, was, and I don't know enough about it to be going on and on about what wing I am. But he, this is this is what happened. I tied right. between a seven and a two. Okay. So I'm between a seven and a two. So I got right. this strong pastoral thing, like I want to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got this other thing that just like doesn't want to sit still, just yeah. want to put a pogo stick on down the road, you know, just yeah. get on to the next thing. Yeah. But that the next number in line was an eight, so I'm like yeah. seven, two, eight, and like all of them are like like close to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The other day I'm going into the store and I hear this guy out in the parking lot. And he's yelling at his, he's yelling at his wife. He's loading something up in the back and he's yelling at her. And she's sitting in a cab and he's like, "Open the gate!" Like getting getting all out of control. And, I, and there's this part of me that's just all about the, you know, it's like an injustice. You know, right. like someone, we need to go get him and Jesus on the right track. Maybe that's what needs to happen. <laughs> and so, like, this this three-way conversation started happening in my head. It's just right. like, you know, maybe we ought to go help that lady out. And the eight part of me was just like, yeah, I think so, too. We roughed this cat up, you know. And the seven was just like, I'm with you guys. Like, I love it. I right. absolutely love it. <laughs> and, then, and then, like, then, then reason won over. And I was just like, yo you got stuff you need to be doing and no one is getting beat up. Nobody's there's nobody getting hurt. Somebody's just having words. You just worry about yourself. You don't need to involve yourself. But that three way conversation that I had going was, it was intense. It was just like, yo, we need to fit. And when all three of them line up like that, like we're being helpful in this situation. Yeah. And it's fun. Yeah. And we're going to challenge the establishment. <laughs> right? I'm like, That's great. Yeah. You're unstoppable. Well, good, good on you for being so redeemed that you're able to <laughs> rain them all in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a one, I'm one for fourteen on that. Yeah, I'm one for fourteen on that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. So, uh, yeah. So, hey, so here's what else is really interesting. So, I don't remember. I don't remember if it was Ross or Jason uh, who suggested I reach out to you oh. and get you on the podcast. I don't remember. I would have to go back and look at my email. Um, I feel like I'm punching way above my weight class today. Man. No, not at all, not at all. And I'll and I'll and we'll get there in a second. I, you may feel that way, especially as a nine. But uh, but you really screwed me up. You really screwed up a whole lot of my thinking with what I had to what I had to do to start figuring out like how you preach. Like you really okay. messed me up. But we'll get there in a second. I don't know if it was Jason. I don't know if it was. Uh, or if it was Ross yeah. who said, you know, hey, maybe reach out to maybe reach out to uh, Aaron Miller, and um, mm. and so uh, and so we made contact, and we talked we talked back and forth, but we just talked about the podcast back and forth. Isn't that isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I think I commented on your beard the first time. Right? That's what. It was. Yeah, that's <laughs> what. It was. Yeah, that's what it was because it was something. It was something about. Well, I mean, with a beard like that, you can't go wrong. Like that's it was right. something like right off of biases. I think right off of biases. Ask anybody who has a beard like that. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, that's okay. Like I would. Like okay, I can spend some time with that guy. Uh, and so we had some conversation just off and on, just some, uh, just short messages. And then yeah. most re- most recently, you sent me the advent calendar. 
that yeah, Christian is, seasons count. The salt that, of the earth Christian seasons calendar. Yeah. Is that something you guys produce yourself? Yeah. So that that's uh, I mean this is the 21st year for it in some way, shape, or form. It started with my predecessor and another woman who was working with him at the time, and uh, he was studying with Brueggemann, uh, doing his oh, DMN, wow. and. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm a little fuzzy on the exact details, but it sort of came up in a meeting. Like, what if we what if we actually used a different calendar to remind ourselves that we're called to a different thing, Love it. a different rhythm in, uh, of life? And uh, so this woman, Janice Loves, her name, she uh, she went home and like mocked it up, basically. And so they had it internally for a couple of years, I think. And then people in local other local churches were like, that's really cool. Can you we get a copy of it? And now. Now we send this thing all over the world, and it's uh, we get artists, largely Christian artists. Um, I don't think we have that uh, exclusive requirement, but that's who tends to put <laughs> respond to our calls for submissions. Right. Um, and uh, we get artists from as as far a range as, as we can. We got a guy from I think from Brazil who, uh, who the last two years has painted something specifically to submit to us. So fortunately, wow. we like times and used it uh so yeah it's just a this calendar i mean I, some people actually use it as their calendar which is really messy because it doesn't line up with the roman calendar it starts the first sunday of advent uh but for those who are, you know I, I mean i use my phone we haven't figured out how to make it into an app that actually works <laughs> you know so I, but it's on my wall it's uh, it's in front of my desk and it, it's just a constant reminder that we shape our lives around the life of Christ and the life of the church, and we're trying to move to a different rhythm. Yeah, not, not the Roman, uh, not the imperial rhythm. Right. Uh, but um, so I, uh, so I, I love, I love the calendar. Uh, if somebody wanted to order one of those or get one of those, where would they go? Uh, the ChristianCalendar.com. Okay. Yeah, it's called the Salt of the Earth Christian Seasons Calendar. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. So yeah, Thanks. so so I, I'll definitely suggest going and getting one because. It's freaking cool. And it's what beautiful. else? Is I want to say it's beautiful this year. We got a new designer, and she just did a really amazing job. She, uh, I think it's the first time we've had a, a a Christian designer, and I'm not sure that necessarily makes a difference. It's someone who's invested in the project in a yeah, different sure. kind of way. Uh, and she just did a fabulous job, and I, I think it's the most beautiful uh, one we've put out yet. So, I, I the coolest thing about this, I I had one of these calendars before I ever knew about this church. So I can actually oh, like, really? commend, like I like I think it's a really cool project, and now I get to be part of it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I like I was following this, and I was I was doing this thing before this was ever an option. Yeah. Yeah, I had, it wasn't until I like the the they they asked me to apply out here, and then when I was reading over the profile, I was like, <laughs> oh <laughs> shoot, I have one of those calendars. That's of really course, cool. of so. course. And so it's got a little devotional. It's got a little devotional on it, right? Uh, yeah, like yeah, there's a little the bit of writing down the side. We also, I mean, if you if you order online, uh, we've actually created a daily devotional based on the lectionary readings, which for mm. uh, churches that don't follow the lectionary may not be all that useful. But I mean, it's a you know, it's a real short, like part of a a verse or two, and then you know, yeah. a paragraph and a little prayer that goes out every day to our email list. Um, uh, so we also have that. But yeah, on the side of each each. Uh, um, season has a description, uh, has some words from the artist, and uh, a description of what the season's about, uh, some words from the artist, and uh, a sort of typical scripture passage of the season. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. What yeah. did you uh, What did you preach on? What did you preach on this second week? Uh, the second week of Advent is always John the Baptist. He uh -huh. comes storming in again. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and. Uh, Matt is we're in Matthew this year, so that's not uh, that's not my favorite version of John the Baptist, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more or less the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked about um, for some reason that his clothing stuck out. I, I think it's funny that both Matthew and Mark describe John's clothing, which I mean, uh, you know, if you know your Bible, you know, is, is a reference to Elijah. So I got to talk about you know that John was dressed up for what he thought was happening. <laughs> he was. He was dressed for the occasion. Yeah. And then I talked about, uh, you know, I used that to talk about how what it looks like to be dressed for the occasion of God on the move. Uh, and I used Paul's image of being clothed in Christ. Uh, how we, what it means to clothe ourselves in Christ. 
and I think when we clothe ourselves in Christ, we do the things that uh, that John talks about. We do uh, we become people of repentance, mm -hmm. become people who don't put our our sense of worth or value or whatever in our uh, in our accomplishments or our family tree. You know, don't presume to uh, to say that we have Abraham as our father. You know that right, right. <clears throat> and uh, I talked about the wheat. I did. I sort of jumped over the the trees being cut down and burned. I talked about the wheat and the chaff, which I think is. Uh, I, I this was a new insight to me. I, I'm sure I'm not the first person to notice it, but I think it's really important that that's not an image of like the faithful being separated from the unfaithful. Uh, not because the wheat and the chaff are the same thing, or one thing, until the until the farmer gets a hold of it, right? Mm. And then the farmer gets rid of the dry and scaly and dead stuff and t leaves behind what's nourishing. So, you know, I think when Jesus gets a hold of us, it, it's not he's not separating us from other people. He's separating what is dead in us from what is live and nourishing. Yeah, to make, that's to make something else out of us. So. That is good. That is a good uh, that is good insight. Not one I thought about. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, it was the first time I. I I, I'd always, uh, you know, I, I I get I get worried, I get anxious about preaching sort of us versus them judgment kinds of things because, yeah. you know, if anything, this is, <laughs> scripture is pretty clear that that you know, the judgment is always comes as a, you know Matthew twenty five, both the goats and the sheep are surprised by the judgment. Right, right. So like, I try to, I I. I Maybe a criticism of my preaching would be that I tend towards the grace side of things more than the judgment side. But yeah, um, but I thought I thought that this I think it's really important for us uh, to to acknowledge that there's there's stuff in our lives that Jesus wants to deal with and make us into something new. Yeah. So that that image that you know we all we all have this kind of protective dead husk on us that is separating us from God and from each other from being the nourishing thing that we're meant to be. And, uh, and Jesus is going to get rid of that and burn that stuff up Yeah, <laughs> and take, so, us in, take us into so, the greenery. Yeah. So, so here's the thing that I, here's the thing that I absolutely, absolutely love is in, in order for me to, in order for me to find a way to study your preaching, uh -huh. I couldn't go to YouTube. I couldn't go no. to a podcast. I couldn't go to the church website. I could find, find it? I could find zero on Aaron Miller's preaching anywhere. I could find zero on nothing. So here's what I'm left with. I'm left with reading your sermon manuscripts that are posted on the church's website. Oh yeah. Okay. I was a little worried you maybe found someone else's website because you said <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't find anything. It was absolutely <clears throat> gone. And so and so this this tells me this is this either hints to your eight wing, or 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 hints to something or hints to something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but before I get there, uh, you're an excellent writer. Thank you. Excellent. I think I'm sometimes a better writer than better than preacher. It's a danger, actually. In what way? Uh, I got to be really conscious that what I like. Good writing doesn't always translate to a spoken. Okay, true. Uh, you know, it's not it's not always engaging. <laughs> true. Yeah. You know, like I've seen really brilliant writers get up and read their stuff, and it just doesn't do anything for you yeah. in a live setting. So the, if you, if you get too kind of technical, you lose the connection with with the people That's you're true. trying to talk to. There, there, there's a difference. There's a difference, and I don't know if I don't know if any of the any of the, the listeners of this have ever even thought about this conversation, but there's a world of difference between the way you read something and the way you hear something, mm -hmm. you know, there's a world of difference. I mean, yeah, like the, and when you speak something, it's different than when, like you're communicating on a couple of different levels. Then when it's writing, you can harness all of it into just words, you know, and it changes it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, changes things. When a beautiful written sentence can be hard to follow when you're speaking to somebody, right? That's true. <laughs> like all that, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, it's it's actually, I mean, it, it's something that I, I really have had to work at. I know, uh, you know, if you want to, when we get to the how is my preaching style changed, I can talk about that if you want. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, so here's one of the, here's one of the things I loved about. Uh, I don't remember the sermon. I ought to, I need to just look it up. I need to look up the. Um, this is the one about the thief. 
Yeah, Christ. God, so Lord. good, eh? So good. Ah. So good. Hey, I'm not kidding you. I'm sitting there and I'm reading this. I'm reading this sermon. And I'm just sitting there. I'm staring at the screen. My wife is up in my office. And she's wrapping <laughs> Christmas presents. She's sitting beside me. Or behind me. And she's watching something on TV. The TV over here. And I got the computer here. And is that me or you? That's me. That's you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm sitting at the so I'm sitting at the computer, and uh, and all of a sudden, as I'm reading through there, I, I'll go, mm. <laughs> and she goes, "What?" And I go, "What?" And she goes, <laughs> "What?" And I said, "Nothing. Not this freaking sermon. It's freaking so good." I can't. I just kept on going down the deal. Just a little while later, I pull up another one. I'm reading through, and I go, "Ah." Oh man, <laughs> she's like, "What?" I'm like, "Freaking good." I said, "This is the last thing I needed was one more preacher to be envious of." That's the very <laughs> last thing that I needed. <laughs> uh, so here's what I loved about that sermon, and I'll I'll figure out the name. Could you tell me the name of it? Do you know the name of it offhand? Uh, that would have been the first Sunday of Advent, so it'd be Advent one, right? I think it's, it should be the last one up there. Really? I think that's, so. That's the one. Should be the most recent sermon. Uh, Call Christ the Thief? I I can find it for you. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. No, I got it right here. I'll pull it up right here. Sermons. Uh, I hate to do this to you, but. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I've got Holy Urgency. Oh, yeah, that's it. Is that the one? Yep. Oh, that is the one. Can I let me just read let me just read a portion of this real quick. Is that okay? Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? I know it's brutal. I know it's brutal, but let me just read All right. this. All right. This is just for this is freaking this is freaking just shook me. It just sh freaking shook me. I absolutely loved it. Um <laughs> in this season, this is this is the very end. There's like three paragraphs. In this season where we're waiting for Jesus again. What do you need him to steal out of you? Or what do you need him to steal you out of? Where do you need him to claim? What do you need him to claim for? Uh, sorry, I'm a terrible reader. Uh, where do you need him to claim for good what's his? Where do you need to let him line your life up with our hope that we have through him who loves us? Where might we leave the door unlocked because we know that when he sneaks in in the dead of night, joy comes in the morning? I freaking just about lost it. Perhaps we need him to steal us out of spending habits and keep uh, that keep us mired in financial anxiety. Maybe we need him uh, maybe we need to be lifted out of lies that keep broken relationships broken. Could he swipe us from patterns that have us working as though our accomplishments, our grades, titles, salaries have something to do with our salvation or any bearing on how much we are loved? Maybe we just need him to steal us away to some quiet with him. Maybe we need to let him jack our cares because he cares for us. It's so good. <laughs> that was just so, so good. My favorite line is that one, where might we leave the door unlocked? Because we know that when he sneaks in in the dead of night, joy comes with the morning. That is just so excellent. That is just so excellent. I appreciate that so much. Thanks. That was great. And you know what was different for me? was as I'm reading it and not knowing your voice, not knowing your cadence, not knowing how, you know, sometimes what you do is you'll just go ahead and superimpose that voice. It's like the Morgan Freeman meme, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They put, they put the meme up and then there's Morgan Freeman's face and then the words and like, you can't not. He's a tool. You can't do it. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't pull Morgan Freeman's voice out of your head and me not knowing your cadence as I'm going through, I'm like, these are just words and, and they're, they're heavy. They're heavy. Mm. It was so good. I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. So needless to say, I went through and I read, I don't know, 50% of them that are, that are on there. I mean, just like, golly, these are like, these are fun. Like this is a, this is a new thing for me sitting down and reading some sermons and yeah, it was excellent. It was excellent. So Thanks, man. I appreciate yeah, that. yeah. I mean, that was, that was a lot of fun. I so uh, you have fun writing them. So <laughs> man, well, you're an excellent, you're an excellent. You're an excellent writer for sure. So tell me something, Aaron. Let's jump into some of these questions here. Sure. My favorite one, my favorite one, passages of scripture that make you laugh. 
I have, yeah. I mean, I love that you asked this question. I've listened to every episode of the podcast. So I, <laughs> well, thanks. I, I'm always thinking about it. I yeah. think, you know, I think the Bible is funny a lot of the time. And and maybe it's funnier. Uh, some of the times it's like in the background, right? Like, I, I, I would, I've always wanted to see Adam trying to dig himself out of the hole that he dug when he said, it was this woman you gave me. You know, like, I think... God could have done a favor and just smacked him right there instead of right. him go right. out. We're just going to start over. We're just going to start. We're we'll getting a new guy. You know. Abraham trying to explain to Sarah why they're about to leave. And don't worry, we're going to have a kid. And yeah, right. I think that's funny. Uh, I think the whole book of Acts is funny if you're in on the joke. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, that's, that's a, there are funny things that happen in that book. And they're serious things, but like, if you don't think God's got a sense of humor, spend some time in the book of Acts. Okay. I, I often, when I hear you ask this question, I think the, the 21st chapter of John's hilarious, right? Because Jesus comes back and he blows the Holy Spirit all over the disciples. And, and it's like, you know, this book was written so that you'd believe. And that like it ends at chapter 20. It's done. Except that Peter is so stunned. He's like, well, Jesus is risen. Let's go fishing. Right. <laughs> right? Let's, let's try to go back to what we already knew. Let's, right. let's just pretend nothing of none of this happened and we're just gonna <laughs> right. carry on as normal. And like Jesus chases them down on the beach and you know, like I, I think that's that's funny. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Uh, my I, I, my 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 own reading schedule, I use this this read scripture app from the Bible Project guys, uh, has me in Second Kings, which is sometimes not the most edifying part of scripture <laughs> right but I, I always think it's funny you get this like pair you know like three sentences about a king and then the writer's like isn't everything this king did written in the annals of judah like <laughs> like you want to read go go there i don't i don't i don't i'm not talking about this guy anymore i'm done <laughs> <laughs> i'm over it right over it. i don't know it's funny i i think you know i i, I don't think funny has to be not serious right I agree Right. Uh, so, yeah. So I like the one. Uh, I like when you know, like there's there's two there's two boat there's two boat scenes in scripture that 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 leave me in absolute hysterics. And the yeah. one is Jonah. Yeah. You know, like what do we need to do to make this stop? Throw me over. Throw him over. And then it stops. Yeah. Like well, that was an awkward moment. You know, yeah. it's just like looking over the side, like. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I like that they, they don't even hesitate, right? <laughs> like, gone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then the and then the Peter. And then when Peter does the same thing, you yeah. know, Peter has that same situation. John, John the disciple looks over and he says, It's him. It's yeah, him. Yeah. And Peter freaking just grabs up his robe and dives in, you yeah. know? Or grabs it. It's kind of funny that he gets dressed to jump into the water, but that I mean, is that, interesting. I understand. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because he had it off, so he put it on. Right. Like when I get there, I need something to dry off with. I don't even know what he was thinking with, about the whole situation. But what's cool is, like, he gets there. Like, how fast can he swim? Like right. faster, like faster than the boat, faster yeah. than, you know. Yeah, they had to drag all those fish, right? Like, <laughs> right. Think. Well, and you know the other interesting part of that is like. So it's so many fish, like they caught all these fish, all right? right? And then Jesus, he gets to the bank, and Jesus says, did you bring some of your fish? And Peter's like, no, I forgot. <laughs> the, I didn't bring any fish. He's like, I'll go, hold on, I'll get the fish. It says Peter goes back, and he pulls all the fish ashore. Like, this, right. what took a boat, and, you know, you know, however many other guys are there? Like, Peter grabs, and he pulls it back on his own. And I think probably everybody's just like, this dude's been sandbagging the whole time. This dude has been sandbagging. There's some the guy in the time. background counting them all, right? Because we get the, we get the exact numbers. <laughs> Yeah, it is 153. Treasurers back there. Like, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly right. Even piles of ten fish. Yeah, for, for, <laughs> for the for the uh, for the Enneagram ones out there, yes. I, be, I believe that's probably you know one, two, yeah. three, four. Yeah. 153, 153, which there's some really cool conversation about when it starts talking about numbers and meanings of numbers. There's some really cool conversations in there. We won't get into it today, but there's some really, there's some really cool ones. I appreciate really cool. that it may not actually have been exactly 153. I just think it's funny. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's yeah. funny whenever we get details like that, right? Yeah, so like One good. of the funnier stories in John is when, when uh, you know, John the Baptist is like, hey, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and nobody does anything. <laughs> That's true. Like the whole the whole crowd just like shrugs its shoulders. <laughs> yeah. And then and then the next day he's like, 
look and then the two go and they're like hey uh wh where are you staying yeah right and, and then we're told like it was it was about four in the afternoon yeah <laughs> there you go like just some, some, some random some yeah. random freaking details for you yeah. yeah that's good yeah i love that i love that um Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world in crickets. So what? Okay. Which I think is a good, you know, this is there's a lesson in there for preaching. Yeah. I think I, u I used that in the uh, in in a sermon recently on evangelism, right? Like the like if John the Baptist is like, hey, look, yeah. do the this guy, and like yep. nobody does a thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And Which then she, then he gets two. Right, and two guys. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know what else is cool about about the John the Baptist relationship? Yeah. John the Baptist, his disciples, his relationship with Jesus and his disciples. Something that's really cool to me, and and it brings me a little bit of a little bit of hope, is that while while John's in prison, he sends his disciples. Mm -hmm. says, go to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Go to him. Ask him. Mm -hmm. Ask him if he's the one, or should we look for another? Yeah. And it's kind of like. John, you like the reason all these people like <laughs> like you're the one that made the announcement. You remember like you made the announcement. You did the baptism. You were at the ordination. Um, you did. You like you remember right? Yeah. Like he's your cousin. Like it's gonna be weird. But just go ask him if if that's them. I think there's a lot of hope in that. I mean, it, what preacher hasn't what preacher hasn't had this crisis of faith at some point in their relationship with God, their yeah. church? And their ministry and their calling, you know. Yeah, I mean, you saw the Holy Spirit descend upon them, right? And they right, still, like, like things are just not working out quite like you imagined they were gonna yeah. work. Out. Yeah, and I think yeah. they probably don't, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's <laughs> common. Like to lose his head before the Messiah did something. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I think that's a hundred. I think that's common. You know, I mean, prison, prison, prison can do that to you. I think, you know. Yeah. I think there's a certain. I think there's a certain level of isolation and loneliness. That happens in a place like that, and 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 that's literal. But I mean, on a metaphorical level, I think that's something we deal with more in in our occupation, yeah. Than 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 a lot of us would be willing to admit, you know. Um, and well, when we find, up, a, you know, I think I think it can be hard to get up every week and say what we believe, you know, preach good news if things are not quite going the way you hope they would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Which happens true. to everybody, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for diving into that with me. Um, that's a that's a good conversation. I think we could probably do that. I think we could probably do that over and over with different. This is this is gonna this is gonna yeah this that's this would be part, yeah. yeah this would be a next episode. We'll do a next episode on this right. one. Uh, mm -hmm. Who inspi who inspires uh who inspires Aaron Miller? I I knew you were gonna ask. I, I mean, there are lots of guys that I, I, love, I love to read. I mean, early on in my ministry, Eugene Peterson kept me afloat. Uh, I know some guys have come on here and talked about him before, but you know, I think St. Eugene has saved a lot of us, or keep, kept a lot of us grounded. Um, I think I told you, I, I, the guy I want to hear you interview is Rich, Rich Velotis, or Theotis, I'm not sure how, you, how to say it. Uh, and I've been watching his sermons just for my own I think preachers need to watch preachers. We need time to worship too, mm -hmm. uh, where we're not in charge. Um, but I, you know, when I when I was thinking about it, I I love watching musicians who are just sort of unconscious with their instrument. You know, like they put in so much work, and part of it's natural talent probably, but it's just so many hours, and you, you just like they don't even look like they're. Like I, I was thinking about my my brother a Aiden Miller. Is it? He's a He's he's our church musician. He's our, our music minister, and uh, and I just like I it, it never ceases to amaze me when he he just sits down and and just plays <laughs> in a way that right. like it's a totally different. And I, I think like I always find that inspiring. I'd love to I, I'd love to imagine being able to 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 pre to preach that way mm. like sort of unconsciously, <laughs> mm. you know, sort of just so like this is so deep down that I don't even have to worry too much about it uh, what would that what would that look like what would that look like i mean yeah on, on i mean i think it, it does it does kind of happen sometimes right where you, you've put the work into the sermon mm -hmm. uh you know and i my one of my problems or for better or worse is i'm i'm a, I'm a sort of diamonds are made under pressure kind of guy <laughs> like i write yeah. saturday morning and sunday morning uh and, and um but like that christ the thief one 
like I got I got a chance to preach that at St. Andrew's Hall or part most of it. Like I I, just, I, I made it a little longer for, for Sunday. But that extra time, you know, like uh, I had I had my my chair of, my chair of session, which is like our our elders, you know, to, told me that was the best sermon he's ever heard me preach. And I think it wasn't wow. wasn't just like what was in the sermon itself. It was that I was it was like deep down in me already. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I do, you know, like I, I'm I'm working all week on my sermon, you know, but uh, that sort of so I, like I think it happens sometimes, but yeah. Um, I just I just love watching that. You know, you watch a guitar player who mm. has been playing for years, and and their fingers just move in a way that our fingers can't. <laughs> My fingers can't. <laughs> yeah, I'm still I'm I'm a dedicated rhythm guitarist. You know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm the same as you. I'm the same as you. Like I'm a three yeah. chords. I'm a three chords. Can we transpose this? Can we transpose yeah, right. this song? Like I need to transpose it. Can we play it E, please. Can we put this back to G where it belongs. Yeah. You know. <laughs> And I, I like, you know, I, I know you, you love comedians, and I, 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 I often like comedians a lot. I think it's kind of hit and miss, and there's always, I don't like to feel like, I'm not sure if I should be laughing at this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> you know, uh, now that being said, you know, like if you can kind of stomach it, some, some of the, some of the guys I think are really funny. A guy like Billy Connolly, who's just filthy, uh, Scottish comedian, if you don't know him, and like not super life-giving but there's an honesty and a kind of like he sees the world in a way that i think is is kind of brilliant i mean he's funny because he's smart he's not just he's not just making dirty jokes right like he's so smart and i was thinking i i watched uh, last week i watched the mike berbiglia the new yeah both of his and seth meyers and uh the the one hannah gatsby i don't know if you've ever seen uh-huh. that you know, some some listeners might. I don't know how people feel about the content all necessarily, though. I think it's it's pretty marvelous. Like, if you want to see just a pure performance, it's amazing. I like. I don't think I've, I've. I don't know. I would put it way up there with like, like just the capacity to get up there and do a thing, brilliantly, it's so tight. And I think like that's hard. Mm-hmm. You know that's hard because there's so many bad comedians out there. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and there can't be dead space. And you can't forget your line, and you can't, you know, they just get up there and right. do. That. And I, I'm a, I'm as you can see, I'm a manuscript preacher. I, uh, and in a, ideally, I've practiced it enough times that it doesn't. People are out sometimes surprised that I, that I preach so close to my text, but mm. because I do kind of know it by the time I get up to preach it, but. Yeah, uh, but I just I, I found that uh, th- those those three comedians are ones who who just uh, did a powerful and that, you know the, the Hannah Gadsby one is just like it's dense it's it's you want to talk about funny being serious like it's a serious thing and I think you can appreciate that regardless of you know what you think about about the specifics of the content. What about uh, what about Dan Cummings? Dan Cummins. Don't know him. I, I, I'm always looking for a new name. Dan Cummins. Dan Cummins. C U M M I N S. Dan Cummins. Yeah. Um, specifically the one Don't Wake the Bear. Don't Wake the Bear. Is that on now, uh, Amazon Prime, I believe, is where I've seen it. Okay. Is where I've seen it. Where I've seen it. Um, oh, the internet will find it. It's, yeah, you'll find it. You'll find it. Now, <laughs> here's the thing Dan, Dan Cummins has. But content wise, like there's some patches of this. It's rough. It's just right. rough. And you just gotta get you just gotta just fast forward, get past it. Probably the first 20, 30 minutes of it, pretty solid. From yeah. there on out, it just starts kind of going downhill. Yeah. Um, but but his approach and the way he the way he performs yeah. is so it's so well done. Like he's a um, like he, <laughs> he talks about his use, his use of, uh, his use of word, his use of word and metaphor and terms yeah. and what he, so he talks about sidewalk and etiquette and, and politeness and manners. And he said, it mirrors the road. Okay. It mirrors the road. <laughs> he said, it's easy. He said, if you're on the right hand side, you, you're always on the right hand side. I don't care which direction you're always on the right hand side. He said, it's, I mean, unless you're, unless you're, in, you know, and in, in, in Europe, maybe, maybe it's on the other side and, you know, and, <laughs> 
And then he said, but it's always on the right, on the right hand side. He said, so if you're on the side, what's on the right hand side? So he's talking about all this. And so he said, now listen. <laughs> and then this is this is kind of his cadence too. He says, now if there's two of you, if there's two of you walking along and you're holding hands and uh, and and you you know you're in love. I mean that's brilliant. I absolutely love it. I think it's wonderful. I think that's just fantastic. But but you know you need to have a plan. You need to act on it. Have a plan and act on it. <laughs> Somebody else comes at you. Hey, single file it. Single file it. Have a plan. Act on it. Yeah, that's the way it works. And, and then he says this term, and it was just kind of funny how he says he says. But if you want, if you decide you want to form a wall of narcissism and <laughs> keep coming down, like, and I just thought that was so brilliant. Um, yeah. There was also another another couple terms I wrote down. Um, <laughs> he says, he says, my wife, my or he said my girlfriend, like she wants me to lose weight and she wants to continue to bake delicious treats at my house all the time. And he said, I'm getting mixed emotions inside my relationship, these mixed messages. He said, she wants me to lose weight and she keeps baking me uh, delicious treats. And he said, she came in the other day and I'm eating these cookies. And she says, Dan, are you going to eat all those cookies? And he said, I, I was planning on it. I was planning on eating <laughs> all of the cookies. And she says, you can't eat all those. They're not good for you. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you baked me cookies, not shame biscuits and guilt wafers. You know, <laughs> like his, like his use. Yeah. His use of wall of narcissism, you know, uh, shame biscuits, guilt wafer. I mean, it's just, just a really, really, really polished, polished guy. And you can tell he's a words guy. Yeah. And I love, like, I love, I love people who, who kind of pay attention and just spin uh -huh. it slightly differently. I, I'm reading, uh, my favorite author, probably, like uh, the, when it's not, you know, theology or church kind of things, is, is Bill Bryson. I don't know if you know Bill Bryson, but uh, he's an American guy who who sort of worked a long time in, in the UK uh, um, as a journalist, and he, he did travel, sort of creative nonfiction kind of stuff. And anyways, I'm reading his new book on. It's called. It's about the body. Uh, so he, he wrote a book a while back, a man kind of famous, called uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything, which is a science book for guys like us who aren't scientists. Um, and this one's about, about the body. And, you know, it's called The Body, A Guide for Occupants. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, oh, wow. He, but he, he's always, like, he, he just, like, just twists it just a little bit. Like, uh -huh. like we're still talking about science. And like, this, <laughs> good. I, didn't, I didn't know science was funny, but it turns out yeah. that it's Yeah, you know, that's good. It's, it's real, you know, like. Pays attention to the details and make it, make it good. Yeah. yeah. Are you a uh, are you a little bit of a black sheep inside the inside your movement? Uh, like in my denomination. Yeah, inside your denomination. Are you a little bit of a black sheep? Uh, I don't know. I mean, a little. You know, by by the standards of my denomination, I, I'd be uh, an evangelical kind of. Uh, you know, I preach Christ and Him crucified, risen and reigning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I'm not alone in that. That's not maybe the strongest voice that people get from the denomination. But uh, the thing that the thing about the United Church of Canada is that they it's it's tried to do a thing that is really hard to do, and sometimes does it well and sometimes doesn't. Which is to to create a space where a really you know they they use the image of a big tent you know. And, you know, my argument is that a big tent has always has to have a central pole. Mm. And, you know, I'm one of the guys who wants to be up there and able to touch the central pole. Like, you change that central pole, it looks like a different thing. Uh, so, you know, I, I think all the church has is Jesus. <laughs> you know, we don't have anything else to offer the world. Uh, other people do social programs better. Other people have better politics. Other people, you know... Uh, that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I, when it, one of the things that attracted me to my church now is that the guy I spoke to first, I don't know that everybody would describe it this way, but he, he described it and presumably someone told him to describe it this way as, as progressive evangelical. Okay. I'm not sure that's altogether helpful, but if, if I have any sort of left leaning social inclinations, uh, it's because of my theology, <laughs> not, I don't, I, you know, I don't tend to, I try not to, I think it, well, I'm not going to pretend I, I, I can do it in a vacuum, you know, I, I, my experience does affect my theology, but, sure. you know, uh, I just preach Jesus, and, and I'm always kind of surprised when people find that, like, appealing, I, I, had, I had a friend who I love, 
from another local church who came to my church and she's actually going to preach for me uh, it, when I'm away in January. Um, uh, it, she, she said, she's kind of newish to the church in, in the grand scheme of things, an adult convert. And uh, uh, you know, she said, so like, did you bring the conservative theology to this church or was it here when you got here? <laughs> It's like, like you've read my sermons. I don't think I, 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 I don't think I'm a conservative preacher. But in the United Church of Canada, like I, I fall on that 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 side of the spectrum. Yeah, you you do. I don't, you do. I don't think I'm a black. Like I'm I'm not alone. I'm not as alone as the headlines would make you think. Uh-huh. Uh And out on the on the West Coast, which is like I mean, Vancouver is is known to be the most secular city in the country. Um. But like some of the most faithful, Jesus-loving United Church ministers I know are out here, yeah. uh, doing their thing. So God's oh, doing a thing out here. Is that that of the of the four cities in Canada? Is that what you mean? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, when I say city, it's, you know, I appreciate the small village. I was talking about yeah. life in Germany the other day. And Germany fits roughly in the size in BC, and it's got something like three or four times the population of the whole country. <laughs> Wow, you know, like we just we got we got a lot of land up here. Yeah, know? we like our personal space. That's right. <laughs> well, we all live like within a hundred miles of the border, right? <laughs> Always. Yeah, it's true. Right. Like ninety yeah. percent of ninety percent of Canadians live within hundred miles of the border. Yeah. Uh, something like that. I, maybe yeah, I was I, I was looking at it. I was looking at it on a I think on the um, on the church website or on the um, it must have been on the church website. There's a map. Yeah, I think, and it's got it's got Vancouver, and so I started backing it out, right. and I start I started giggling, and I was just like, you know what, I can't I cannot wait to tell him, you know what, you're actually closer to Russia than you are to me, like yeah. that's like I think you're actually, <laughs> which you're not, you're not, <laughs> but like look how I, freaking far away that is, you know, so far away. I I I was I, I participated in a program several years ago through Wesley Seminary, a leadership development thing, uh, so it was all in the, I was the only Canadian, it was all Americans, and and like. A lot of like it, it was hard for some of my colleagues to conceive the fact that the woman coming from Seattle to Florida, like had twice as far to go as I did from Toronto to Florida. <laughs> right? like, yeah. It's a big country. Like, yeah. And yeah. it's yeah, I mean, it's a six hour flight for me to get home <laughs> or home it's back yeah. to Ontario, which is where I'm actually from, uh, which is only halfway across the country. <laughs> Wow. I mean, it's not true. It's a little more than halfway, but, you know. Well, here's one of the things that I, I mean, just, just as you begin to talk about, you know, are you, are you a black sheep or are you more evangelical or are you more conservative? I was super surprised knowing what I know about, um, about the, uh, United Church of Canada to yeah. come across the sermon that is all about sharing your faith. And I thought, I yeah. wonder, I wonder how different this is because that's a sermon, that's a sermon that's preached five out of five out of six Sundays. I mean, five out of, I mean, four out of five Sundays, you know, I mean, sure. that's just, that's a normal, I mean, that's a normal, like we hear that kind of thing all the time. Yeah. Uh, is that pretty common where you are or not, not as common? I, I would say not yeah. um, for the reasons that I outlined in that sermon. Uh-huh. Uh, we're just not, and it's too bad. I mean, you know, without getting into a history lesson, I wouldn't be the person to give a history lesson in the United Church. But, uh, you know, we, we so tightly tied what we were doing to a Canadian culture, right? Like the United Church was founded mm -hmm. to be the Protestant denomination of Canada. Like we were basically founded to compete with the Catholics who had a unified voice across the country. And we wanted, we wanted one too. So a few of the denominations got together and made, made this other denomination. Um, and, and I think for a long time, it kind of worked, you know, that when the country was nominally Christian, when people still sort of basically knew the story uh, and, and we could expect people, I mean, you know, there was a time where you could build a church and expect people to come mm -hmm. uh, and like what you do <laughs> and know what to know what to do. And, and we, you could expect that people would come back when it was time to get the kids baptized or get them in Sunday school or whatever. Um, when it was time to get married or, but now like 
in BC, like here particularly, uh, you know, like you got three and four generations of people who've never been inside a church. Not for a wedding, not for a funeral. Nobody gets married in a church. Nobody does funerals in a church anymore. Nobody, nobody would come to, nobody outside the church, uh, and obviously this is a broad stroke statement, but, you know, like uh, people aren't going to come to us because they have needs, because they wouldn't know what we would do for them. Uh, yeah. Other than like try to proselytize, uh, which you know, <laughs> happy to share our faith, but you know, they, um, so so I think it's not, and I, I think we have all kinds of anxieties. The United Church has been, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I think is good is that we we've, we've sort of acknowledged that oftentimes evangelism has been sort of cloaked with colonialism, oh. uh, that it, you know. I, you know, the, the narrative that the church is dying is fundamentally racist, right? <laughs> I mean, only the Eurostock churches are dying. White people aren't going to church anymore. But in other areas of the world, lots of people are going to church, and, and the church is growing. So, like, we got a problem, not everybody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and part of the well, problem is that we, you know, we just, we, we, we had this notion that, you know, to be a good Canadian was to go to your local mainline church and then people discovered you can be a good canadian without giving up your sunday mornings mm. and you know so i i think the church you know like part of the reason to share and part of the reason i think especially lay people have have the you know have the advantage is that there's no social pressure to come to church nothing mm. and nobody would second guess you if you decide to sleep in on sunday morning to not give your money to that organization you know like so why do you do it like tell me that story <laughs> Learn, and, yeah. and, and we got to learn to tell that story because we haven't practiced telling it. We don't even tell it in, in church. Like, you know, we don't ask each other, how is it with your soul? Mm. <laughs> because that's practice, that's personal. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, I've, I think one of the things that's cool about my own <clears throat> church is that they have kind of embraced the possibility of being this sort of alternative community in the world. We just also have to figure out a way to tell the world about it. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not good enough to be over here authentic in a corner until we die. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so I, I, you know, like we've been, we've got a grant coming. We're going to try and plant uh, a different kind of community, not necessarily a worship service yet, but a different kind of thing in the local pub on campus. Uh, just a space for people to come. Cause I, I have this working theory that, that, uh, in a culture where, you know, hardly anybody is actually hostile to Christianity up here, right? Like my experience has not been, I don't think anybody has ever been actively hostile, but they are totally indifferent. <laughs> and uh, I think that's harder to overcome than animosity. Mm. At least if you're, you know, if someone's angry, you can have a chance to talk about that thing. They don't yeah. care. And they have no reason to believe, and they are perfectly happy, right? At least they, you know, uh, they're living they're in an affluent culture. They they live in the most beautiful place in the world. They seem to be perfectly, you know, like why? And you want me to come up and forsake my life for the sake of the kingdom of God? Like I don't know. Like what does that even mean? Hmm. So we got to figure out. And I'm part of what I'm trying to figure out for myself is is how to how to tell that in a kind of in a compelling way in this context but also just get better at talking about it yeah you know, like we believe this thing we believe it enough to you know i've i've staked my life on it <laughs> and you all have shown up every you know many of you show up every sunday <laughs> some of you like at least once a month you know uh <laughs> yeah give up your sunday morning to come here and do this like why yeah what one of the brilliant one of the brilliant lines from that sermon um that you yeah. that you put together one of the brilliant lines was um, when you were talking about your son learning yeah, how to yeah. do the Rubik's cube yeah. and how he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and he couldn't get the two corners to match up and he just kept working at it and kept working at it. And then finally he got it to which you said, so wh what happened? Like, how did you do it? To which he responded, I don't know. It just, it just sort of happened. And you said, and in your sermon, you said, of course it did, because that's exactly what happens when you continue to work at something and try to get better at it, it just happens. That's freaking good. That's just yeah. like, that's, listen, we're, we're evangelical, you know, with a, with a little, with a little touch of militants, 
on our <laughs> end. You know, like we kind of have, you know, oh, indifferent. Oh, you want to arm wrestle? You want to arm wrestle about yeah. it? You know, and then we'll have yeah. a conversation. The loser goes to church. You yeah. know, like we're, like we're, we'll pull any, any sort of stunt. But like that was a really good line. That was a really good line. I mean, you know, the, the image I used in that sermon at the beginning is, is of a marriage, right? Like, or any relationship. You know, if we're talking for very long and you never find out that I have a wife, uh, you know, we start to share time together and do things together, and like it comes as a surprise to you that I'm married. You're gonna you're gonna wonder about that relationship. So like, why do we why do we hide this other relationship? Because I mean, the you know liberals are, are are pretty okay with the idea of faith as relationship, mm-hmm. right? Like we're in this relationship with God. Um, you know, a tone that we get a little squeamish about, but but relationship relevant. You know. <laughs> I, I I love atonement. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he, uh, but um, so but we don't we don't share it, and and I want to I want to know why. Like, and I do think that if you if you're doing things if you if you if you have a spirit like if you're reading your Bible if you're praying if you're doing the things that Jesus tells us to do, you know, caring for your neighbors, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Uh, like it's just going to be part of your life, and 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 I think for those of us who've been sort of trained by kind of modernist enlightenment thinking that religion is a private, personal choice, and not, you know, I mean, if I believe Jesus is living and reigning, it doesn't much matter what your opinion about that is. Correct. <laughs> I mean, either Jesus is living and reigning, or he's not. Right. And you know, I, I mean, I happen to think he is. So how? But how do you like? in a culture where like you can't start there. <laughs> right. right. I don't, you know, like I don't. Yeah. Like, okay. Well, I mean that conversation, you know, that conversation is cut short. I mean, I of course do, but yeah. in the uh, instance that you're yeah. talking to somebody that, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, <clears throat> like, I, I've, I've, I, I think, I, I think in that sermon, and certainly I've made fun of myself before, you know, like I was kind of like Peter's instruction to, you know, yeah. give an account of what gives you hope. If, if someone should happen to ask, you know, Just be ready. So, Just be ready. The reality is, yeah, is they're not living sufficiently interesting lives for the gospel for anybody to think to ask. Most of us look exactly like our neighbors. Mm. But, you know, like a, I often sit in my overpriced apartment on the campus of UBC, you know, wondering if this is what the Lord requires of me because it doesn't doesn't look different than anybody around. So, like, how how are we different? What's what's and, and why does this story matter? And yeah. I mean, I think we got to start asking and answering those questions for ourselves. Yeah, uh, and not in a kind of general theoretical kind of way, but in a real lived kind of way that people will find compelling. Because I have this, I, I I think that you know, on a campus, for instance, you know, everybody come, everybody who comes to a campus is asking the same basic questions. I think, how should I live? What am I going to do with myself? Yeah. What's what's you know, what's the best use of my energy? How am I going to change the world or not change the world? Yeah. You know? uh, and I think the gospel has stuff to say about that. Not necessarily black and white answers, but you know, I think uh, I, I, you know, hook them up with Jesus, and they'll, <laughs> they'll, 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 you know, if we can get people actually, you know, in, introduced to Jesus and let him do the work, let him separate yeah. the stuff from the wheat, uh, then That's... I think I think something good can happen, you know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's so good. That's such a that's such a good metaphor. The the chaff and the wheat. That's a um... That's a good one. That's not. That's not one that. That's not one that. Uh, that never, never hit me. Just like you said it. That you know. You think sheep goats. You think sheep yeah. goats. You know. Yeah. You know two that's different things. Different, yeah. Yeah. This is different. That's completely different. I. Uh, I went to that. I went to that same passage. Uh, yeah. For for Advent this week and just talked about how we think of Jesus meek and mild. You know, seeing your picture, Jesus, you know, yeah. with his hands like this, with his freaking hair, you know, <laughs> like that's how we think of him, yeah, you know, yeah. and he's, uh, he's got some really cool light coming in on his face. I mean, he's really, but then John's like, when John talks about him, John's like, yo, uh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> this is, yeah. you know, this is going to be bad. Like he's. <laughs> you remember the old bumper sticker? Maranatha, Christ is returning. Boy, is he pissed. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of yeah. along those lines. It's kind of along the, yeah, which yeah, I, share, I, I shared that. 
peace with a sword, you know, and exactly I exactly right. Those are not yeah. my, you know, that's not where I often go. I do, this, you know, this is my, this is my Advent t-shirt. I don't know if you can see it. Cast down the mighty, send the ritual. Oh yeah. Fill the hungry, lift the low. That's freaking good. Where'd you get it? Right. It's the Magnificat, right? <clears throat> it's That's in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Where, where did uh, you get the shirt? Uh, a guy named Ben Wildflower. He's got an Etsy shop. Okay. Well, it's dope. I love that it. That is cool. And uh, That's real you know, and I think like, you know, if you're a twenty something, and like this is you know like the the gospel is radical. You know, I don't know. I, I listened to Wilman, and he was talking about you know maybe the gospel is for for young people. <laughs> but I think you know like I, I think I think I. And just, just just to kind of bring it back to what we were talking about before, um, I, I think that uh, you know we don't we often tell people to go off and get established and then come back to the church when they're ready, <laughs> kind of thing. And I want a chance to say you know like Jesus cares about what you do now. Mm. Jesus cares about how you're a student. Jesus cares. So I was talking to a guy, a student, yesterday uh, at, after church. You know like he's in engineering and uh, like. I want to create a space where we talk about what it looks like to be a Christian engineer. Mm-hmm. Are there things you can do as a Christian engineer and not do as a Christian engineer? I don't know, but like, let's at least invite Jesus into that conversation <laughs> and listen hard, you know, uh, and, and, and create a kind of community that will support you when you don't, when you say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Because yeah. Jesus doesn't want me to. <laughs> I love gonna it. Fly with, that's not going to fly with most of your bosses. Just <laughs> Right. Like, yeah, I love it. Oh, Aaron, I wish I wouldn't have burned up so much of our time earlier. I've got a, sure. I've got another meeting coming up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I need to, uh, I need to get myself together for. It. I'm obviously, I'm obviously ruining my own day by being slow. So I hate to, freaking mm-hmm. run part of yours and the next one. But can, but can we do this again? Can we do this again? This is, this is an excellent conversation. We only, look, we made it through, we made it through freaking two questions. We got two questions in on this list. That's all we got. Yeah, I mean, we yeah, we touched on some of them. We talked we talked about some of this, but we didn't even get to like I'm I'm interested to get some of this stuff. Like these are excellent. These are excellent questions. So uh, that's a great one. No. Oh man, Aaron, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to do this again. Yep. Maybe uh, maybe this next week we can connect again. Or are you gonna be tied up next week? No, no, yeah, no. Let me know. Okay. Uh, this is you know like like I said all day. Nobody else wants to have meetings. So. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so. perfect. I'm that's the that's the boat I'm in. Ain't nobody trying to hang out. So this yeah. is perfect. So. Oh. Man, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for being on the Homeless Podcast. I'll get a hold of you. We'll finish up our conversation this next week. It'll be cool. Yeah, man. Looking forward to it. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. This is good. See you.